We are in Romans chapter 5. We are moving to Romans chapter 6. Because the last two verses of Romans 5 should be in Romans 6. Let's call them Romans 6, negative 2, and negative 1. Please turn in your Bible to Romans 6, negative 2. <laughs> and otherwise known as 5, uh, 520. We are uh, continuing in the study about salvation by faith in Abraham um, or through in the way that Abraham was uh, was saved and the fulfillment of the law of Moses in the law of Christ and uh, it's just going to be us in the Bible today so you could turn in there to Romans 520 we've been looking at this uh, for some time now and, and we're just going to keep going until it all has been covered but the um, the gist of this is that, you know, Peter's warning that Paul's writings are often misunderstood is well worth taking. And they are often misunderstood. And this is an excellent example. Uh, Romans as a letter is talking about the Jewish persons who have obeyed the gospel and the Gentile persons who have obeyed the gospel and what the purpose of the law of Moses is and what the purpose of the law of Moses is not. Um, and that is strictly what it's talking about. Everywhere that it says law or the law, it should be capital L law because it specifically is talking about the law of Moses. And no, we're not saved by the works of the law because we're not required to eat kosher or to wear garments made of only one thread things of this nature in order to be right with god those were symbolic and they were clean in and of themselves but they were intended to lead to something else which is what we have today in christ the fullness of salvation the, um, the faith that is in jesus that's what romans is talking about people far too often think that it's talking about Salvation by faith alone versus salvation by obedience to commands. And that is not true. That is what we call a false dichotomy. But um, that's the wrong question. It's not a question of obey or disobey. It's a question of Jewish or no. <laughs> uh, are we keeping the law of Moses or not? Not are we keeping God's law not are we are we keeping commandments no the bible never entertains that question of course you're keeping commandments um, that's human doctrine not anything that the scripture teaches at all so we are talking about the law and the law of moses specifically everywhere in romans let's put that out there that's the right question um yeah, on false dichotomies, I refer you to, to uh, Acts 2.38. Um, I know for a long time, brethren, we're thinking that the question is Holy Spirit, gift or giver. That is not correct. That's a false dichotomy. It is true that a genitive case in and of itself is an indeterminate thing. But the thing that's not, uh, or the thing that's in question is not gift or giver. The question is giver or receiver. Is the Holy Spirit the giver of the gift or is the Holy Spirit the receiver of the gift? And you say, well, that question doesn't make sense. Well, why doesn't it make sense? Well, because it says you shall receive the gift from the Holy Spirit. Yes, it does. So actually, there's no question whatsoever. Ah, yes, you're right. Thank you. We should never ask that question again. Obviously, the gift comes from the Holy Spirit. It can't be him. And we're not giving it to him. We're receiving it. That's the truth about Acts 2.38. You know, if, uh, if I had a box in my closet that you happened upon when you were putting away your umbrella, come into the house to meet me. And, and you said, hey, what, what's that box? And I said, oh, that's my parents' gift. Well, you would still not know had they gotten me something for me and that's what's in that box and that's why I have it here at my house. Or did I get something for them, but I haven't made it over to their house yet, and that's why it's in the closet in that box? You don't know. Giver or receiver is what you don't know. But you would never think that my parents were in that box. 
So the Holy Spirit is not the gift either. You would never think my parents were in that box. You can't think that the Holy Spirit is the thing that's being given. The question is, does he give or does he receive? And obviously in Acts 2.38, he gives. That's a false dichotomy is what I'm getting at. So this is a false dichotomy too, this idea that, oh, it's obedience or not. No, that's not the question. Obedience is out of the question. Of course we obey. The question is law of Moses or not. Obedience to what? To the law of God, to the law of Moses. Is the law of Moses the law of God? That's the question. And that's what Romans is answering. All right. So there's an example of a false dichotomy. There are a lot of good ones. Now, Romans 5.20, the law came in to increase the trespass. What law? The law of Moses. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What does this mean? Does it mean that God saves by grace alone, apart from your obedience? No. It means that even though the law of Moses came in and could not save and really just highlighted things that were wrong without giving you an actual remedy for those things that are wrong, it all the more points us to the righteousness leading to eternal life that is in Christ Jesus. He is the answer. The law of Moses came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So as we learned what sin was and as we learned what was wrong and as the scriptures go on, the, the prophets go on, and we, we see a little bit more, understand a little bit more about God and about our relationship with him as his people. Right? Sin increases, but so also does grace. We come to realize that God is being gracious. There's not something special about ancient Israel over and, over and above any other man. They were just men. And it's true even today. We who obey the gospel are not different from others in the sense of more capable, more intelligent, whatever. We just made a different choice. That's all. We chose to serve God. That's that. But we are saved by grace. It's God's, God's um, free gift. He chooses to save us. He could hold us accountable for the wrong that we have done instead of forgiving us. But he is gracious. He does not. If we obey him, if we repent, if we become Christians, which is why Romans 6 says, continuing the thought, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? Well, what does he mean? <laughs> well, if the law showed trespasses with the result that the grace of God became very clear, should we continue in sin that grace may abound? He's anticipating a question from the Jewish members of the audience who want to continue the practices of Moses. Well, if grace was abounding under the law, then the law should keep going. Well, no, by no means. How can we who died with regard to sin live any longer in it? Right. Now, we talked earlier about the fact that those who sinned under the law perish by the law and those who sin without law also perish without law, meaning without the law of Moses. Everybody sin, everybody's accountable. The things that the law of Moses enjoins upon the Israelites are enjoined upon the Israelites, not the whole rest of the world. But the world isn't without any governance. They still are accountable to God. We all are. Because we can know that he exists, that he is eternal, that he is divine. You can see it in the creation, in the order of things. And that makes you accountable. So, we have died to sin. We can live no longer in it. That's an old life. Don't you know, verse 3, that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? That's an answer to the anticipated question, what do you mean we died 
to sin. Well, yes, we did. Don't you know that when we were baptized, we were baptized into his death? We were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. See, we're raised from the old ways, the dead ways, a new creature. We're buried with him by baptism into death so that as he's raised from the dead, we also are raised to a new life, a new creature in Christ Jesus. This is why, as long as we're in the, I don't know why I'm in the, uh, I don't know why I'm in Mythbusters mode today, but I'm just in Mythbusters mode. I don't know. But as long as we're in Mythbusters mode, uh, this is why you can't be saved the way the thief on the cross was saved. As soon as somebody says to you, well, the thief on the cross believed it and, and he went to heaven without being baptized, you know for sure that that person does not know what it means to be baptized. They can't possibly understand it because Romans 6 and verse 3 says, we were baptized into his death. And verse 4 says, we were buried with him in death. That as he was raised, we also might walk in life. How was this? Baptism. Ah, yes. Why is this a problem for the thief on the cross? Well, obvious. Jesus hasn't died yet. He hasn't been buried yet. He hasn't been resurrected yet. You couldn't baptize him. You'd have to hold him underwater for three days. Right? It's not even possible. He couldn't do it. So, yeah, that just means they don't understand it, which is what you already knew when they were espousing something like that. If we've been united with him, verse 5, in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. The second overtakes the first, of course. It's always better, as the, uh, the proverb said, the end of a matter is better than the beginning. <laughs> True. Perhaps we've died with him, but that's united with him in a death like his. That's with a certainty that we'll be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, that we would be no longer enslaved to sin. One who has died has been set free from sin. That's a Christian. If you have put to death the old person of sin and been buried together with Jesus in baptism, then you have been set free from sin. You are a Christian. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him. And we know Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him, verse 9 tells us. But the 10th verse, the death he died, he died to sin. Once for all, the life he lives, he now lives to God, implied forevermore. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Don't present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. Present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. Your members to God as instruments for righteousness. I don't think you can get any plainer than that. Frankly, if you're wondering, is Romans about obedience or not? Hmm. No, that's not the question. That was never the question. And you can see plainly in chapter 6, you can entertain no such thing. Oh, maybe you used to be Jewish. Maybe you used to be in the Roman mystery cult. Whatever. That's dead. And now you're a new person in Jesus. And that's where forgiveness is. And you, you know, he died to sin once for all. He's alive forevermore in God. 
And the twelfth verse, says, or I'm sorry, the eleventh verse, so you also must consider yourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And that consider is the same one that we studied at length in Romans chapter 4. He considered that God could raise him from the dead, says uh, if, uh, Hebrews 11. But also, um, God considered Abraham righteous because he believed him. And Abraham was justified or proven righteous, made right, by the offering of his son Isaac, which came later, as James 2 relates to us. So we also consider ourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body. Don't let it reign to obey its passions. Stop presenting your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. That is to say, your body, your body parts. Present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And your members to God as instruments for righteousness. It can't be any plainer. The child of God is supposed to be obedient. It's supposed to be presenting himself to God as the servant. I have hands to do the work that God wants me to do. And I have a, a mind to serve God with it. Presenting the parts of the body to God is a service instead of presenting them to unrighteousness. Sin should not reign in the mortal body and make you obey its passions. This is uh, what the Lord told Cain, if you may recall. He said to him, sin's desire is for you, but you must master it. Implied, not the other way around. This message hasn't changed. It's the same message. Let not sin reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. It should be the other way around. Your desire to serve God reigns in the body. 14th verse continues, For sin will have no dominion over you, since you're not under the law, but under grace. Sin will have no dominion over you because you're not under the law, but under grace, meaning the law of Moses. Sin has dominion over you in the law of Moses because the law of Moses does not have a remedy for sin. As Hebrews tells us, the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sins. And if those offerings were able to cleanse the conscience of the worshiper, then why did they continue to be offered? That's the argument from Hebrews. So if we were under the law of Moses, yes, we would be under the dominion of sin. I mean, sin would have a lordship over us because there's no remedy. There's no out. There's no solution to this problem. But that's not where we are. We're in grace, meaning we're in the Lord Jesus, and there is a remedy for sin. What then are we to sin because we're not under the law, but under the grace? By no means. Don't you know if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, your slaves are the one whom you obey? Whether that's sin, which leads to death, or obedience, which leads to righteousness? Yes, if you present yourselves to anyone as an obedient slaves, you are the slaves of the one whom you obey. Can you get the door, Nico? Thank you. Um... You are slaves of the one that you obey. This is a very important thing. Uh, people say words, one of our good friends. Words, words, such lovely words. <laughs> but what will happen? What are the actions? And she's more right than I like her to be. But um, still, this is a valid point. Words are just words. We say we believe X or whatever, but what do you actually do? Again, Romans 6, 16 says, you are slaves of the one whom you obey. That's just the way it is. You can say what you believe, but your words may not accord with what you actually do believe, which is not known you know, what you actually believe is not known by what you say. It's known by what you do. Now, of course, we want to bring those 
as close as possible to identical. But the fact is, you're going to be judged not just by your words, but also by your deeds and actions. It uh, seems like a simple matter, but uh, it clearly is not. It's a tricky thing. Slaves of sin leading to death or slaves of obedience leading to righteousness. One way or the other, you're a slave, though. And that's maybe the lie of the devil. The devil says you can be free if you decide not to care what God says. Mm, okay, maybe you might be able to stop caring about it, but you're not free. That's a lie. You're a slave of sin. Slave of desire, slave of whatever is happening in the world, whatever the trend is, whatever is in power. Don't be fooled. It's not freedom. There is no freedom. You were not created that way. <laughs> You're going to serve something. You're going to serve someone. It should be God. However, the 17th says, thanks be to God, Romans 6, 17, thanks be to God that you who once were slaves of sin have now or have since become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and having been set free from sin have become slaves of righteousness. Yes, we all were once slaves of sin before we obeyed the gospel. But now we have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which we were committed. What's that standard? Well, again, you look up earlier in the chapter, it is putting to death the old person of sin, burying that person with Jesus to be resurrected with Jesus. How do you do that? Baptism. What kind of baptism? The baptism of Jesus in water for forgiveness of sins. Why water? Acts 10 the Holy Spirit fell on the Gentiles, and Peter said, Who can forbid water that these should be baptized, same as we? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Which is exactly what he had done in Acts 2.38, although the water is not mentioned there. It's the same baptism, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's water. That's how you get forgiveness. That's how you are free. And you have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. You were set free from sin to become slaves of righteousness. Still not free, if you will. We're free in God. Free from our sins or, and, and the consequences of those sins uh, in eternity. We have forgiveness in God, and that's good. Now, the 19th verse continues, I speak in human terms now because of your natural limitations. Just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity, to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free with regard to righteousness, but what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. Now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. Yes, he said, I'm, I'm trying to relate to you in terms of slavery because you can understand that example. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Your human limitations. He said, you guys are already fighting between yourselves, Jew and Gentile. And we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be explaining it like this if that weren't the case. You wouldn't be fighting like this if you didn't need to have this kind of thing spelled out in this way in terms that you can understand. That's what uh, 19 is saying. When you were slaves of sin, you were free regard to righteousness, but what fruit, verse 21, what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. Good point. 
What fruit were you getting from those things? Really, nothing good comes from that. That's the thing. Nothing good really comes from it. We can look back a little bit. Remember, um, remember the advice. Look back, don't stare. <laughs> or glance back, don't, don't stare. Right? Uh, you can look back and you can see, yeah, I did some things I shouldn't have done. I did a lot of things I shouldn't have done. There was nothing good that came out of that. You leave that and you walk away from it. That's what he's saying. What fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? If you're ashamed. Are you now ashamed of those things? Is it different from what it used to be? Aren't you a different person? Did that old person die or not? I'm reminded of the stories I'm told of an old preacher, Marshall Keeble, <laughs> who told of an old man. I don't remember his name. But anyway, who had obeyed the gospel and, and uh, he was walking down the street and they saw him outside of the bar and said to him, hey, why don't you come in? No, nope, not going to do that. Well, where, you used to come here all the time. He said, no, I didn't. And I said, well, yeah, yeah, you did. And he said, no, it wasn't me. That man died. I'm a new man. Right? That's what happened. It's true. That's what it's like to be a Christian, a child of God. That man died. I, I never went there. I don't do that. That's not me anymore. That's gone. What fruit were you getting of the things of which you are now ashamed? Now that you've been set free from sin and become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. So the point of our obedience to God, the point of that this sanctification means being made holy. Or turned into a saint whatever being made holy justification is the same thing as righteousness those are the same word in the greek actually even though in english they sound pretty different what what it comes down to is it's in a court of law you are pronounced innocent or you're vindicated you win your case is what that means so you're just you're declared just if you know you did not commit murder no, this is a just person, an innocent person. Or you're suing and uh, alleging that somebody has taken something by fraud or whatever, and you win. They say, no, this person is right. He was done wrong in this matter. He's right in his cause. That's what righteous means. That's what justice means. So when you're justified by God, we're saying that God is declaring you right. You are now forgiven. You have a clean slate. That's all we're getting at. So these words are being used um, in the text quite a bit, and it can probably be confusing. But I'm trying to get back to the simple idea that they all basically are pointing at the same thing. That we've done wrong. God, because he's gracious, has made it possible for us to be forgiven. And then, because he's gracious and we are obedient... He has forgiven us. And now we're being declared just and walking away from court instead of going to jail. God has forgiven us our wrongdoing when we obey the gospel. We've been set free. Because of that, we owe him everything. And we walk for him. We live for him who set us free. The just outcome of our actions is death, condemnation in eternity, in hell. But the grace of God makes it so we can be forgiven if we will turn from those things and serve him from now on. Now that you've been set free from sin and become slaves of God, the fruit you're getting leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. Sanctification here, eternal life there. That's all we're saying. Now you are being holy. You're dedicated to God. You're living for God. In the next, you have eternal life. Because God is gracious. And God is good. And God is forgiving. And that's good. We're glad that we serve a God like this. We're glad that God is like this. In the universe, there could be something different. But that's not what's happening. Our God is a loving God, a gracious God. All right.
We will pick up this thought next time, 623, like the others, goes with the seventh chapter. <laughs> 623 should be 7, negative 1. But yes, the end or the purpose of holiness, the purpose of being right, is eternal life. That's where salvation is. Today, are you a Christian? Put him on in baptism for forgiveness of sins. If not, we will help you to obey the gospel, whatever it takes, because that's the most important thing you could possibly do in life, ever. But a person who is already a child of God must repent if there is sin in the life. And we're glad to pray with you for you that you might be restored to God because all of us are subject to temptation and frailty. Any of us could do wrong and need the prayers of the saints as well. We're going to help each other on. If, if we can find any way to help you to obey the gospel, if we can help you in your spiritual need, let that need be known at this time by coming to the front while we stand and sing.